What's up, y'all? You're listening to the Maya Nation podcast. I'm Alex Miller, joined always by Travis Brown of the Eagle. Travis, dude, my allergies are killing me this week. Yeah, it's been real bad. And cedar fever and real compared to and, and and adding that in with and I know we'll talk about this a little bit later. I went to A and M's open baseball practice last night and like it, I I've been here. This will probably I think this will be in my eighth baseball season, and I never fail to forget how cold it gets in Bluebell Park. Oh, it's like an like ice box, get man. The, you get the allergies and the cold, and it's just it's I I, I will be definitely ready for warmer weather in March, which I, I think the men's basketball team is ready for it to be March already too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of mind boggling, honestly, how A&M just really takes number six, Tennessee to the woodshed on Saturday night. And then they turn right around on Tuesday and lose on the road to six win Vanderbilt. Um, you know, <sighs> That's just been kind of, in my opinion, the, the, the theme of this team, though, is that they, they tend to let their opponent set the energy and the tone and the pace of the game, and, and A&M doesn't always quite match. They either play up to their competition or they play down, and that's really shown on both sides of the spectrum the last two games when you look at uh, what they've done against the two schools in the, in the state of Tennessee. Yeah, I, I do think that there was a certain level of kind of playing down. Now, I, I don't want to say it was necessarily playing down. I, I, I want to say that they let Vanderbilt dictate the pace of play that they wanted to play at because A&M plays slow. Don't get me wrong. Their their pace, their, their possessions per game is, is on the lower end, but Vanderbilt's even slower than that. And so A&M in essence, wanted to push play and and wanted to push the tempo a little bit, but they just never could achieve that. Part of that is because Vanderbilt hit shots. Um, they they didn't play great defense, and 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 that's the the craziest part about this whole scenario is that you know you go back about three week three games ago, about a week and a half ago, and Buzz Williams when talking about A and M's shooting woes this season said. He really believed that they would shoot better and that their averages, their percentages, would get more towards the mean. They're, they're a better shooting team than they had been. And, and in essence, after he said that, it, it, it became true. They shot 47% um, at Missouri. They shot 46% against Tennessee. And they shot a SEC high 51% from the field against Vanderbilt. Also an SEC high 44% from three-point range and... Went 17 for 17 from the free throw line. It's the first time that <laughs> yeah. they've gone 100% from the free throw line this season. And yet, they still lost to a Vanderbilt team that only had one win in conference play. And that was against Missouri, who has no wins in conference play. Which is just mind-boggling. But when you really look at it, Vanderbilt beat A&M at its own game. It was only the third time this season that Vanderbilt or that a team had out offensive rebounded A&M. They did. They had a decent amount of second chance points, and A and M's streak of uh, ten or more um, turnover well, ten or less turnovers, 10 or less turnovers was ended because they had twelve. They got points off turnovers. A and M's game is to offensive rebound, to shoot more shots than the other team does, and to limit turnovers so that they have, if they're going to shoot at a low percentage, they have more opportunities to make shots because they're shooting more balls. Vanderbilt shot 12 more balls than A&M did in that game. So, you know, it, I know a lot of people have just simply wanted A&M to shoot the ball better, shoot from three-point better. It, it's just not that simple. They, they need to limit the amount of times the other team takes shots because that if you can shoot a lower percentage and still win a game if you're shooting more shots. And Vanderbilt did a good job of, of beating them at that. I, a lot of that had came down to just not playing great defense. They had a lot of points in the paint. Vanderbilt did. That's just the antithesis of how A and M plays defense. They want teams to shoot a lot of three pointers, and they want to stack the the uh, the paint and not let them have those high percentage shots. Um, uh, uh, Van Allen um, L- Luden uh, did big. a real did a really good job of of making space and creating scoring chances in the paint. So. You know, it's kind of like going back to that LSU game. That LSU game, everything went wrong for the Aggies that they lost at home. 
They they else you out rebounded to them. They out turned over. They 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 had less turnovers. It they just it was everything the antithesis of a, what A and M wants to do. And I said it wouldn't happen again. It it kind of didn't happen again because A and M shot the ball pretty pretty great in this game. But they let those things flare up one more time, and that's why they lost the game. I, I still think this is a blip, uh, kind of like LSU was. This isn't going to be something that they. Uh, probably carry over into most importantly the Arkansas and Georgia games. Those are the games they need to have. They don't necessarily need to win this Alabama game, especially after the Tennessee game. But the the important thing to, to, from all of this is the fact that yeah, it was a game that 100% A and M should not have lost. Even when coming down to the wire, they shouldn't have lost it. It was a crazy shot that won it for Vanderbilt at the end of the game. But it's not going to affect – it's not going to put A&M on the bubble. They're still pretty well into the tournament field. You lose against um, Arkansas. You probably lose against Georgia. That's, that's going to put you on the bubble, but A&M is still firmly in the tournament field. Here's the thing, though, is that A&M's gotten off the bubble, but how's that, how is a game like that when now you have two quad three losses, how might that affect seeding down the stretch – when you get to Selection Sunday, maybe having a chance to creep up a, as high as a four or a five, now you're looking at you might go down to an eight or nine. I think Joe Lenardi yesterday put out his latest bracketology and had a And M at a seven seed, which you know A and M had been on the bubble. They had been either you know the lat they had never been out, out of the field of sixty eight, but they had either been at, at the last four in or the first first four buys. Well, and that's just. With Lenardi, there's sure. a lot of other, you know, when you look at the field of 68, they've had A&M pretty firmly in for the last three or four weeks, not really anywhere close to the bubble. It's, you know, the it's not too different from the, the college football playoff committee. You don't know which year, each year, what the committee is going to value more or less. Um, so when you look at all these bracketologists, they have their own ideas of what the committee will value more or less pretty much always quadrant one wins is kind of where it starts. Um, but A&M has actually been a pretty decent metrics team uh, this season. You know, uh, the D last night, they, they were looking at almost being a top 40, both offense and defense heading into the Vanderbilt game, uh, which is great. We um, talked last week how the best of the best teams are in the top 30 in each category. Right. So they're creeping up to that upper echelon. And Ken Palm and his adjusted offense and defense is something that the committee will look at. And so right now, actually, that Vanderbilt game, they, they did they improved their offense. They're up to 36 now. Uh, but their defense dropped off from 42 to 62. Um, and so you, you want to try to be in that top 50 range. to but, but And so some of these things will factor in. Um, but A and M just to, they have a unique resume. Like you, very rarely do you have as many losses as A and M has um, uh, uh, nine losses, but also having five quadrant one wins, which is tied for Tennessee and the most in the SEC. Like yeah, you can say yeah, they already have nine losses. They might they're probably going to finish the the season with with double digit losses the regular season. But also, they have five Quadrant One wins, and they played a really tough, like the 26th, 23rd uh, strength of schedule, I believe, non-conference, um, 20, 21st non-conference Yeah, because how many schedule. Quad One games have they played? They've played uh, nine. Um, so they're five and four. Where they're five and four in Quadrant One. They're, they're, they're uh, eight and six in quadrant one and two which is good it's just two and three in quadrant three is bad but i think the, what the work they've done in quadrant one and two is is going to help them um with quadrant three and, and they're even looking at maybe gaining some more because i believe florida is just right on the edge of quadrant one uh quadrant two and they survived lsu last they night survived lsu last night so florida could actually move in and add a sixth quadrant one win you can't hold a team out of the tournament with six quadrant one wins. And, and even as of the last time I checked, you know, Bart Torvik, uh, who has a algorithmic uh, bracketology system, they, uh, as of last night, he had them all, all the way up, I believe, to a, a seven seed. Um, I'm curious to see. I haven't checked today as things have kind of sorted out. Um, he, they bumped down to a nine seed, and he has not been bullish on A&M. 
um, this year, they've skewed way further out than probably what the reality is according to his analytics. So it's going to be a tough stretch, but they really did do a lot of their work on the front end of the season. They can't lose to Arkansas. They probably can't lose to Georgia, but the rest is going to be icing on the cake if they can win some of those games. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, hey, uh, you know, we're in the thick of basketball season right now, but uh, baseball is around the corner. Travis, you were out there last night, brave in the cold. God <laughs> bless cold. your soul. It was it was really on cold. this Ash Wednesday, and uh, yeah, what would you see from the Aggies as they head into this twenty twenty four season? I mean, this is going to feel a lot more like that first season under Jim Slosnickel two years ago when they brought in a lot of transfers. Um, they had a lot of uh, outgoings. They had to fill a lot of spots, um, and trying to kind of see how this team is going to, this coaching staff is going to shuffle around some of these players. Um, you know, and, and really and truly, the, the starting lineup, or starting rotation, is what's going to catch my eye the most early in the season because it is so open up for grabs. They mixed a lot of guys. Nathan Detmer, for the most part, was the stalwart in the starting lineup, but you had Chris Cortez, you had Justin Lampkin, you had um, uh, Troy Wansing, you had a lot of guys, Will Johnson at times, mixing into the starting lineup, and nothing was ever the weekend rotation, and nothing was ever truly set because they couldn't find a grip. They they couldn't throw strikes, they walked a lot of batters, um, and they uh, hit a lot of batters, they got free, a lot of free bases, and, and had like 35... I believe it was 35 straight games where a starter didn't pick up a win right through the stretch of conference play. That being said, they still almost made it to a Super Regional. And you would look back two years ago with Micah Dallas, Nathan Detmer, um, those guys in, in that, that lineup, they still made it deep into Omaha, basically swinging their way there. They didn't have they were a in the final four <laughs> pitching staff. Yeah, they had a good, decent bullpen, not great pitching staff. So this year, you know, you the options that they have in in the starting lineup, you have Ryan Prager returning from uh, Tommy John this season. Uh, you have Troy Wansing, who has kind of had some strong portions of, of the season last year. Justin Lampkin's coming back. Uh, Shane Sadeo's coming back. Those are the obvious rotation answers. The interesting part about that, all left-handers. And I know Schlossnagel typically likes to either go right-left-right, left-right-left, uh, through the weekend series to give some different looks to some teams. But there could be a, a really strong case that they might have to go left, left, left um, through the starting rotation just because of the experience that they have coming back That of, of guys who can who can put in uh, quality starts six to, to seven innings. It'll be interesting to see, A, how well Ryan Prager comes back uh, and, and if he is, you know, sometimes with guys with Tommy John, when they get back in there, there's that little bit of a mental hurdle, when you, especially when you're throwing a slider. Um, some of the things that puts a little bit more strain on, on the elbow, uh, sometimes curveballs, um, how well he's going to adjust that and he's going to be able to throw those for strikes. Uh, Wansing is probably a lock for the starting rotation. And then Lampkin Sadeo, you know, one of those guys probably will find their way into the starting lineup, uh, starting rotation. And one of those guys is probably going to be their kind of long relief um, go-to left-handed arm from the pin. The other interesting note is Braden Montgomery, the transfer in from Stanford, the, the number one transfer everybody was going for this year. He's going to factor big into the lineup. I saw him drop a home run to straightaway center during batting practice last night at like a 109 exit velocity. <laughs> Uh, and he's going to factor into the outfield, probably moving uh, Jace Laviolette to center. He might probably feature out in right. Um, but he's probably going to see some time on the mound as well. He only pitched 12 innings last year for Stanford as a two-way player. Um, but he, uh, he could very well factor in and be a right-handed arm in that rotation if uh, they want to use him in that capacity. Because when you do that two-way thing, it is a little bit easier when the guy is starting and, and you're not bringing a guy out of right field into to pitch and all the craziness that that can, can cause um, in, the, in the lineup. So could be an option there. He, last night he, he walked two, he had a wild pitch, but he didn't allow a hit. He struck out one and allowed a, a, a run in an inning pitched um, there. You know, another guy who can factor in, Chris Cortez, um, but I don't 
see him just from what we saw there, it would be hard for him to factor into at least this weekend's rotation against McNeese because he threw uh, four innings uh, of of pitching last night and walked some guys. So it wasn't one, two, three innings. He threw a lot of pitches. I, I don't see him factoring in maybe a Sunday, but even then, that doesn't usually go with how Schlossnagel likes to do things. He wouldn't really go left, left, right. Um, so maybe Cortez is their Tuesday guy to start out with since last night was, since Tuesday was uh, uh, the, 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 the kind of dress rehearsal um, scrimmage for, for the Aggies heading into the season. So this, I, I, I want to say this because this is what typically is conventional wisdom with baseball in, in that A&M is only going to go as far as their starting pitching takes them. But we said that all two years ago, and that took, and you know, some average starting pitching took them pretty far into Omaha if they can swing the bat, and and so, uh, yeah, that my eyes are going to be squarely on pitching this year. Or well, start and, this year. Well, and looking at the lineup, I mean, they've got they've got some new faces. They've obviously got Jace back, and he had a fantastic freshman season. Um, Ryan Targotch is back. He did. He wasn't spectacular last year, but you got to think he's a guy that they're going to be counting on. He's wearing number 12, of course, basically the team captain, right? And from there, I mean, they've got they've got a lot of transfers. Um, Max Coffer's back at catcher, but, uh, you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see how they piece together the the field and in, in the lineup. And I, I'm curious what, what it looks like Friday versus maybe what it looks like at the end of the tournament up in Arlington in a couple weeks versus what it looks at the start of SEC play in mid-March. I think what they did really well in the transfer portal this season was getting depth to their batting lineup because last year, with, especially with some injuries, when guys went into slumps, they, they really didn't have anybody that they could kind of sub in and let the guy get some rest or, or try to work his way out of it um, or to have another guy step up and just – try to try to get hot and in that position it, it, they really just kind of had to stick with their lineup and hope guys uh, work their way out of of slumps this year they have some depth and some options of course it's going to be headlined by Jace LaViolette and Braden Montgomery uh you know they they, they kind of split what I kind of foresee maybe as being the 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 first team starting lineup amongst the two teams in the in the inner squad last night but they had Jace LaViolette batting second um and Braden Montgomery batting third in one of the lineups um, I, I think that that could probably, you know, batting guys that your best hitter second has kind of been a little bit more in vogue uh, lately. Uh, Ryan Targotch was batting fourth on a different team. I could see him maybe slotting in behind Montgomery as the cleanup hitter um, for the Aggies uh, in that situation. Uh, Ted Burton, the first baseman, actually leading off for one of the teams that um, – uh, could be I, I, I see him um, being the starting first baseman. Just looking at the fielding, I think Max Coffer is probably going to be your starting catcher. Ted Burton's probably going to be your first baseman. Targotch is probably going to be at second. Caden Kent, um, a guy who was I, 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 one of the guys they could try to slot in at places here and there last year, is probably going to step into a starting role at shortstop this year. Uh, you make and uh, Gavin uh, uh, Grav Gravov. I can't say his last Grahovic. name. Grahovic. Grahovic. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm a cease moment there. Uh, he's looking like he might start at third base. You know, he was a highly uh, touted prospect uh, coming out of high school. Many thought there's a chance he could go MLB, um, but he ended up uh, going with the Aggies, pulling his name out of the draft. Um, and uh, I think he's probably going to slot in and start there at third base. You got Montgomery and Jace LaViolette. And then left field, you have some options. Hayden Schott, uh, uh, the Columbia transfer, uh, was playing out there last night and uh, could be an option. But then, you know, you have guys like Blake Binderup, who has been tearing the cover off the ball exit velocity-wise uh, this season, who can step in. Uh, uh, Jackson Appel, uh, a, a catcher who uh, could step in and hit. Uh, Ali Camarillo, uh, a transfer from uh, uh Cal, Cal State Northridge, Cal State Northridge, um, who who might platoon with Caden Kent, uh, or uh, could could be a a good pinch hitting option as well. Travis Chestnut comes back as a good pinch running option, and he had a actually a few big hits over there. Jack Bell is a freshman could factor into some of this, so they they actually have a pretty deep 
bench they can go to, it seems like, for if they need some pinch hitters or need some guys to step in and in situations where other guys are slumping, which is just not necessarily a luxury they had uh, last season? Well, you know, maybe looking a little big picture, you, you talked about this team will probably go as far as its pitching will take it. Who are maybe some of the key teams to look for in the SEC and maybe how far A&M could go depending on how things shake out for the Aggies? Yeah, um, you look at, uh, you know, in the athletic, the... Uh, uh, the Mitch Light, right? Well, in the uh, yeah, the they interviewed Schlossnagel and he yeah. said... Um, he said that Alabama was a, a team that that he really liked, and that's interesting coming from everything lost and uh, the the gambling scandal, the gambling scandal, and all the turnover that they had. Um, Florida with uh, uh, their two way pitcher um, that that is just going to you know, Arkansas, LSU, the defending national championship, Vanderbilt. I mean, this is a very top heavy league. Um, I think Tennessee might have a little bit of a backslide season this year, even though, um, they're still going to be good. Um, so yeah, you got to look at the Florida, the Arkansas, uh, the Vanderbilt, they're kind of leading up the D one baseball top 25 up there, but A&M comes in at, at, at uh, number eight. Uh, Didn't with Florida get Colby Shelton out of the transfer portal from Alabama? I believe they did, and, uh, and that uh, dude raked and last LSU year. And LSU got their one of their top pitchers, yeah. Um, out of uh, but 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 yeah, Alabama still is might be one of the dark horse teams. They're coming in at number nineteen, um, but yeah, um, Florida, Arkansas, LSU is going to be the teams that that uh, I think A and M fans are going to keep an eye on. Well, Travis, I know you're just looking so forward to getting a Ben's pretzel every weekend out at the ballpark. Oh, it's so good. Ben's pretzel so tasty. If 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 Ben's pretzels wants to sponsor this podcast, they, they really please should. email me. <laughs> please email me. That's the first time it, you don't want you to email Robert Cessna. No, email no, you. email me, not Robert <laughs> Cessna. He will lose it in his computer. Awesome. Well, hey, I think that's all we got for y'all today. So thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Miami Nation Podcast. Be sure to check the eagle.com for all of our coverage on Texas A&M Athletics. We'll be back next week, hopefully, talking a little more Aggie sports.